Well, your scheme seems to have worked, but we left port in such a rush. So tell me about my new passengers, Jigod. Sure, this is Paylor. I'm a humble dancer now, but once I was a member of the Yellow Clothes. For a time, we were the most famous mercenary group in Larrick, assembled and led by a tough old dwarf whose motto was, We're a freelance, but we don't work for free. We did all kinds of jobs. Once, down in a southern province, an unruly mob kidnapped the governor's children. They swore they'd kill one hostage every day until that governor surrendered to them. While most of the Yellow Cloaks confronted the mob, Gerta, Jeet, and I snuck into the hideout and freed the hostages before the sun set over the mountains. Right, uh, then we have been this other time. A group of citizens concerned about democracy in their province pooled their money and hired the Yellow Cloaks to take down a corrupt politician called Lord Bagaram, who'd been overtaxing the population, hiring violent thugs and junk. So our mage, Veronica, cast Invisibility Sphere, and we- Wait, Lord Bagaram? Wasn't he the governor of Larrick's southern province? Was that the same governor as that first story? Huh. Now that you mention it... Tales from my RPG campaign, Sea of Secrets. Jinx, Uhnisho, Adria, and Blue. Hiya! Why don't you tell us about yourself, Captain... Chizel, Sana Chizel. Maybe another time. Like I said, we left in a rush to help you guys escape whoever was after you. But that means there's a lot left to straighten out. Our cargo was already loaded, otherwise you would have been out of luck. But I still have a lot of details to handle, including some grumpy crew who expected two more days of shore leave. Brother Anvil will show you to your quarters. Welcome aboard! I'm the ship's chaplain. The sea wing's lean and compact, so the rooms here are nothing fancy. Oh, I know how it is. You know I came aboard in a box? I don't need a lot of space. I can lie down in a closet. Look at her, commanding her crew inspiring them. Look how they all respect her. Did you see how she looked at me? You think Captain Sana is interested in you? Not yet. Not interested like he is. But she is curious. I, I need, need to, to learn, learn more, more about, about her. The Sea Wing was a sleek elven cargo ship. Not the largest, but she cut through the water like a knife, sailing around Dialia's Cape into the thrashing sea. Though, they would largely be staying within sight of the coast, on their way to Stadt Verbundet. Sir, um... Rudolf. But everyone here calls me Longlegs. How does a human get to be captain of a mixed crew like this? I'd think Eladrin and elves like you probably have much more experience. Absolute. Capitan Chizel is part owner of the Sea Wing. But beyond that, there is... Something about humans, the strong ones, a drive that pushes them forward in a way that we Eldar cannot always match. And when she does need the wisdom that comes with a few more decades at sea, she has me and our navigator, Shoitu. Her name is Shoitu? Hmm. Jigad stays below decks a lot and hangs out a bunch with Shoitu because he figures the navigator is the person with the most information, or at least the most maps. She seems to be quite the introvert, so while sometimes she is interested in his countless stories of exploration and archaeology, other times she kicks him out to be alone. Good night, Captain. Good night, Pelor. How do you people sleep alone all the time? It's so cold. And lonely. No luck? I thought you like all kinds of people. I do. But... He's focused on the captain. But she doesn't seem interested. Have you even asked her? I have a sense for this. 
When they want me, I can tell. And when they're not interested, I don't bother them. But if she doesn't like you, why don't you find someone else? But she does like me. It's just... Then why don't you ask? She likes me, but she isn't interested in dancing with me. Right now, anyway. Maybe she just doesn't do that. Not everybody does. That's... That's not it. I, I'm telling you, I have a sense for these things. But Sana is, I don't know, special? Everybody's special. She's pretty special, though. Paylor thought long and hard about what he could do. Quartermaster, Paylor asked, how's our store of booze? Jinx, you know many songs. Any good sea chanties? Only then did he suggest, let's throw a party. A party? Yeah. You told us that, to help us out, you had to cancel shortly for some of your crew. We don't want to start a month at sea on the wrong foot, so let's break out some extra alcohol this evening, a treat or two from the chef, and try to improve the mood. I don't know, our stores have a certain amount of... Paylor and I are entertainers. We'll get everyone in the mood. <sighs> All right, Paylor. I'm sure the crew will enjoy it. Aim for an hour or two before and after the evening shift change so everyone gets a chance. Aye, aye. Yes, sir, Captain. I'm aiming to get everyone in a good mood, not the mood. That's what I meant. So they got Tiggy, the ship's gnomish chef, to whip up some kind of a treat. Orange cookies. If they're made with oranges, why are they green? Don't ask. Once the beer started to flow, Jinx and Paylor started singing and dancing, and Brother Anvil and some other crew brought out small percussion instruments. Pretty soon, most people were dancing. Though, Adria noticed the navigator was not on deck. Navigator Soitu. Yes? Did your parents name you Water Map? Or is that just a coincidence? Maybe it was destiny. Huh. Not a party person? I prefer to be alone. That I can understand. Seems like almost everyone is running away from something. Have you heard about the war in Oras? Have the Yichun recovered their numbers already? It feels like only a century since the last major... How bad? I don't even know. I found out only a few days ago. But we are all called. I'm a cartographer, not a blade singer. What good would it do for me to join the front, only to be cut down or turned to stone? I did not come here to shame you. <sighs> if anything, my own absence is much worse, because I am a fighter. It sounds like you came here to shame yourself. Huh. Is that what drew me to you? Do you know how to read a map of sea currents? Care to join the dance, Captain? I can put this away if it makes you nervous. Hardly. Nice. Is that all? <laughs> wow. I knew she was cool before I knew she had a magic staff. Is this some form of flirting I'm not aware of? It is for those two. What is that sparkling? You mean Paylor's eyes? No, in the distance. It's a flock of blades! They almost look like they're on fire! Brace yourself. Something is wrong. Mend the weapons. Brace for trouble. Party's over. I'm not familiar with these birds. Are they migrating? Not migrating. They are coming at this ship. And there's something bigger with them. The unnatural flock was composed of firehawks. Strange animals, too strange even for the nearby jungle. How or why they had crossed the veil was a question for later, though. 
as the party readied for combat and the ship's crew scrambled to secure loose items and to arm themselves. The Sea Wing was not a warship by any stretch, no anti-ship weapons, but she did mount a pair of heavy repeating crossbows, fore and aft, deck sweepers to help deter enemy boarders. Fortunately, the shipwrights, knowing she might one day operate in the stranger seas sailed by the Eladrin, had mounted her crossbows so they could aim upward as well. In moments, the swarm was upon them, though appearing in every other way to be birds of prey with wingspans up to one and a half yards. The firehawks were either headless or had heads wreathed in enough flames to obscure what lay beneath. They dive-bombed crew using fly-by attacks, hit-and-run tactics which made it difficult to hit them back, but some also seemed to be attacking and trying to ignite the ship's sails. I shoot one down. Looks like they're only minions. I'll start my bard song. Give the whole crew bonuses to hit. I'll shake my fist at the air, menacingly. Longlegs is doing a decent job on the aft deck gun, but there are dozens of these things, and the sailor manning the front seems a little panicked. You aren't sure they've hit any. Panicked, huh? Hey, I'll cast Demoralize on these things. Try to scare off as many as I can in a 30-foot spread. Does that affect everyone? Because it might undo my singing. Nope, only affects enemies. Okay, well, they're flying in and out, but I'll say you can catch 3d6 of them. A half dozen fail the will save. Hmm, the power makes them shaken, which is just a debuff, but that's technically a fear-based status, and these are wild animals. Sure, I'll say the affected ones are driven off. Nice. Captain Sauna whacks one of the burning birds with a readied attack from her extendo staff. Keep those damn things off the sails! We need to put out those fires immediately, before they spread. I'll grab two water buckets. I figure I can still mostly climb with a bucket hanging from one hand, and I'll carry the other in my mouth. Look, Misho can climb like crazy, you're a jumping and climbing machine, and the rat lines up to the mast are practically a rope ladder. Yay. But I want you to make a balance check to see how much water you lose. Joe. Um, I got 11. That's not a bad roll, but climbing with two buckets is super hard. By the time you get to the top, you've lost two-thirds of the water from the one in your hand. You manage to keep your head steady, though, so the bucket in your strong shifter jaws is still mostly full. Well, I'm built for fighting monsters, not fires. Front gunner missed again. This clearly isn't their main job. Am I proficient in these things? The main theme of the fighter class is a trained soldier or weapons expert, and these are closer to a heavy crossbow than to a siege ballista anyway, so sure. Alright, good effort, but let me try my hand at this. Replacing the gunner on the forward weapon mount, with his full base attack and good dexterity, Paylor swings the repeating crossbow around and shoots down two of the birds. Meanwhile, the attacking birds did more flyby attacks, coming for Paylor and successfully burning Misho and Blue, both surprisingly tough, as well as hurting Longlegs and a number of other sailors. Are they prioritizing the sails and the gunners? They aren't attacking like wild animals. I mean, why would animals fly way out to sea to attack a ship? Someone must be directing them. Then the something bigger Adria spotted earlier pops up over the deck. Manticore! The winged magical beast, with the body of a lion and a spiny, scorpion-like stinger, flicked its tail to fire a barrage of sharp quills, hitting Paylor for 13 damage and killing the sailor beside him who was helping reload the crossbow. Ja! Stay with me, Ja! I'll spend one charge of my belt of healing on Paylor. You get back seven hit points. Misho, you see a bird perched on a manticore's back. A regular bird? With a head? Yes. Its head turns, and as though it noticed your interest, it takes off, flying away. Druids! Again? I'm in tune with nature. Druids ought to be my natural allies. What did we ever do to them? Whatever set them off the first time... I'm wondering if those roadside idiots got off word somehow that we killed them. So they're attacking us because we stopped them from attacking us? Great! The real question is, do I pounce on the manticore or on the bird that's trying to escape? The bird, which is definitely a druid, is already over water. Whereas, at this moment, the manticore is flying over the deck. <sighs> Uhumisho can swim just fine. If I start the day with certain soul melts, I'm an amazing swimmer. But going overboard off a moving ship? I rage and pounce on the manticore. 
Misho landed on the Flying Beast, his Soul Meld's pounce ability letting him attack with all four limbs, dealing massive damage and driving it down into the deck, where Brother Anvil and some of the more daring sailors could join in. The shifter suffered some falling damage, but mostly cushioned by the monster, it seemed well worth it. Adria took over reloading on the forward repeater, as Paylor swung it around to pepper the beast with bolts, and Jinx, still singing, always singing the plus two hit and damage song, bravely ran over and healed Misho after the Manticore tore at him with its own deadly claws. The Firehawks were still causing problems, killing Hannah in the crow's nest as Sana and her crew tried to keep the sails from burning. Longlegs got a few, and Adria shot another with her bow between reloads, so when Misho and the sailors slew the Manticore and blew demoralized another half dozen of the Fey Avians, the few remaining stragglers flew away, leaving an eerie, uncomfortable calm aboard the Sea Wing. The sails were mostly intact. The ship had enough cloth stores to patch the burn holes. The deck was covered in smoldering headless birds which Tiggy, the ship's chef, was already starting to gather up, and the priest was caring for the wounded. But there was no patching over the fact that three of Sana's crew had been killed. So yeah, you guys are able to get some rest, but it's not a happy morning on the ship. Unfortunately, sailors Hannah, Ja, and Ilan are dead. Some others are injured, and though most of you didn't get that drunk at the party, the hangovers seem extra rough after all the fighting and stress. What's unfortunate is what happened to my party idea. The party itself went fine. Problem was more the after party. I didn't get with the captain, we got attacked, and I didn't get with the captain! What, what I want to know is, what the hell is going on? I have never seen such an attack, especially not in the middle of the gulf. Well, normally birds come out to sea to die, right? <laughs> you get some funny looks for that. It seemed too coordinated for just random flock behavior. Miso and I saw a normal looking bird riding that manticore. It may have been a druid in animal form, directing the firehawks, but we have no real proof. Can you think of anything your crew might have done to piss off some druids? Jinx! I'm just trying to think of ways to deflect from us. Technically, you guys haven't done anything to piss off druids. Well, the druids were pissed at us, nevertheless. And then we killed a bunch of them. Let's be honest, our presence on this ship definitely attracts trouble. Obviously in the meta sense, yes. I think the question is whether there's an in-universe reason. I don't see what we could have done to draw the ire of the cleansers. Cleansers? Why do you assume it would be cleanser druids specifically? Some time ago, a sect of elven druids launched terrorist attacks in an allied nation, seeking to cleanse practitioners of the arcane. Our king and queen called them to submit themselves to the crown's judgment, and these druids resisted. And worse, they burned down villages in Talaris. King Dietrich had no patience for violence among his people, so he and Queen Floretta rode out in person and these cleansers were forced back into the jungle, where the goddess of nature, Dialia herself, intervened. She allowed only the leaders of the cleansers to be taken back to face justice, but protected the rest who have lived in the jungle ever since. When he says some time ago, he means centuries ago, long before I was born. I've heard this legend. They say Queen Floretta and the goddess almost came to blows. Hot. Well, the gods work in mysterious ways. Regardless, I want to thank you all for how hard you fought to defend the sheep. Wolverine and Disco Fever did all the heavy lifting. Disco Fever? <laughs> if there's any other way we can help. Yeah, I want to help. It's a long way, even to the first port, and we are all in this together. Well, everyone aboard sheep is expected to lend a hand here and there, but after... Uh, without... If some of you are willing to learn the ropes, it would help. <sighs> Without Hannah, Ren is the only one left who doesn't hate the crow's nest. Being the ship's eyes is an important job. I have been called observant. My eyes are the eyes of an eagle. 
I haven't dimmed my vision by staring at tiny things right in front of my face. Very well. I will have Ren train you two. He will decide if you are up to the job. I'm up for anything. I can dance, lift, carry, dance. I could be the captain's right-hand man, or woman. Well, or man, if she preferred. Not sure what I can do. Oh, I can crawl into the small parts of the hold and mind thrust the rats. If the cook doesn't get to them first, she sure as hell won't. Diggy is banned from cooking rats, and she knows it. You may hear other rumors about the gnome, and some are true. Including the rats. Formerly including the rats. But if you hear that Tiggy is a cannibal, I can assure you that rumor is made up. Chef is not cannibal. The day after, Ren showed Misho and Adria what to look for up on the crow's nest duty, so they could start taking shifts on that highest part of the ship. What's with your eyebrows, Misho? This morning I called upon the spirit of the raptor. Eagle's eyes, you might say. Jinx sang melancholy songs, trying to distract from the loss to bring up the crew's morale, but gradually, respectfully. Meanwhile, some of the birds they had fought, the firehawks, had worked their way into the midday meal. Secret ingredient? This is gonna be excellent! Oh, you're gonna love it! I'll be the first to try. Trust the cook. What's it taste like? Well, there's a slight problem with the firehawk meat. The fact that they're on fire? No, the fire goes out when they die. The issue Tiggy found was they had a hint of... Soap. Tastes like evil? Not evil, just a bit like soap. That's why she didn't roll them out right away. She spent yesterday experimenting to find the mix of spices to counter it. The end result tastes pretty good, but still has that faint hint of soap flavor. Most people can just ignore it. But some people can't. Everybody's taste buds are different. I've eaten much worse in my time as a mercenary. Each player made a die roll, just a one in four chance, and it turned out Blue and Misho couldn't stand the soapy taste. Do we need fortitude saves or...? No, no, it's not actually poison, but it kind of tastes like poison. Firehawk meat is just disgusting to you two. I'm sure I could choke it down in a survival situation, but I'll just dip into our regular rations till the birds run out. Really? I thought I covered it up so well. You should have stuck with the rats. Ha ha ha, that's funny. Ha! No. No rats allowed. Captain's orders. Don't listen to them, Tiggy. I loved it. Tastes like spicy pheasant. Spicy pheasant with a bit of salt. Pretty good, though. The next day, Adria spots dark clouds. Looks like a storm ahead. As the storm rolls in, the PCs are suspicious, fearing more druidic influence. But they see no evidence that the storm is anything but natural. I don't see much lightning. Maybe that's a good sign? Well, I'm staying below decks unless something happens. Otherwise, I end up smelling like a wet dog. Blue Passenger God, who had procured a sack from somewhere, which he clutched in anticipation of high seas. But wandering on, he found Tiggy battening down the ship's galley. So you have been cooking rats? No! Well, I mean, obviously, yes. But Captain Sana said, no rats! That was an order. I only cook them for myself. She's a great captain and all, but real picky about which mammals go in the stew. Hell, I'll eat the rats. I'll take rat over soap burns. How do you cook them? I like to slow roast them till the meat just falls off the bones. Ratisserie. Ha! Ah, that's great! I'm calling it that from now on. Except I can't tell anyone. Anyway, I don't see what the big deal is. Everything I've made with rat has been great. Except rat tartar. That was a mistake. Oh, I'm getting the shits just thinking about it. Light rain quickly turned to a downpour. The agile sea wing could handle sizable waves, but only with a steady hand at the helm to tack against the wind and to keep her pointed into the waves. Blue kept Tiggy company. The gnome became a lot less bubbly and energetic in the dark, silent kitchen. Her knives, ingredients, and cooking fires locked away, leaving nothing to keep her busy. Have you ever tried cooking with lightning? No, I'd love to try. But I shouldn't. Ships and lightning don't really mix. Plus, it'd be a waste if I burned the rat. She clearly has no actual intention of trying it, but you can see in her eyes how it captures her imagination. T 
Tiggy's awesome. So, know any good goblin recipes? I hardly know anything about goblins, except that they kind of look like me, but green, and they live far north of Bagdon, beyond the mountains. You don't know any other goblins at all? No family? Never met them. Never had a home. I'm not even sure I'm a real goblin. Well, you're a real somebody. That's what matters. All I really know about goblins is that they grow rice, and they're ruled by orcs, I think. I guess I don't have a home myself, except this ship. I rarely see my own people either, but they're out there. Gnomes spread out far and wide across the worlds. We're survivors. I'm starting to think I'd like to be something else, or something more anyway. More than just a guy who survives stuff. Well, surviving is step one. As long as you're managing that, you just have to pick what your next step is. Like Jagad, Adria suffered from a little seasickness as the ship bucked violently back and then forward, cresting the largest waves, so she conjured her disc to dampen the motion, trying her best to meditate through it. Become one with the disc. Become one with the disc. After about four hours, though, they reached calmer seas, the wide eye of the storm and various people came up for air, including Brother Anvil, who began praying to the Weather God. Shouldn't the prayer be during the rough parts of the storm? Won't do much good if I get swept off by a wave. With confidence like that, you must have great influence over the weather. Priest's task ain't to control storms, just to seek Larathal's blessings. To make sure he knows we are here, to fight for us. To fight? That's right, he is the god of weather, among other things, but the domains of the gods are shared, contested. Within every cloud, every wave, every raindrop, there is a constant battle of wills between Larathal and the Dweller, goddess of storms and the deep. The Illud call her Blibon. Aye, before their civil war, when they were just part of the Empire, they all worshipped her, like the Diluvians still do. Just imagine the terrible howling gales back then, at the height of their power. Her power. But for all my lifetime, I think there's been a bit more balance between the depths and the skies. What with the Illu joining the good guys. Anyhow, our god's pretty busy fighting for all them raindrops at sea and on land to keep the harvests growing and the forest, everything in its place. So it doesn't hurt to say the prayers a few times in the eye of a storm and make sure good Larathol remembers to take care of us. A ship, even a fine one like this, is such a tiny thing on the great wide sea. Just another raindrop floating along. Soon the storm got rougher again, but by morning the skies ahead cleared, and Sana and Longlegs were finally able to pass off the helm to Shoitu, trudging back to their respective quarters, exhausted. Great work, Captain. I've been through dozens of storms. Longlegs has probably seen 200. This was an easy one. It's always a team effort. You want some company? A hug? We could just hug. By breakfast, everything is back to normal, although the stew Tiggy served to Blue and Duhamisho was a slightly different color than everyone else's. Extra flavor. Does anyone notice? Um, you catch what may be some curious or knowing glances, but most of the crew seem happy with their Firehawk stew. Though you do notice Captain Sana poking and pushing a spoon around her bowl, as though inspecting for alternate meat. So, how did you become a captain so young, Sana? <laughs> I don't know how young you think I am, but I'm closer to middle age, at least for us humans. Well, you sure don't look it. Mm. As a girl, I always wanted to see the world, but I didn't really know what that meant. When I took a job as a sailor, though, that's when I fell in love. A ship at sea is free to go anywhere, yet you have to fight at every step. Fight the wind to make it serve you when tacking against it. Fight the currents to get where you want to go. It's a constant struggle for freedom. 
But Captain Anders showed me how once you know what you're doing, when to tack and when not to, when to surrender to the weather, waiting for your turn. It's a struggle that you can almost always win. So I saved up, and when I had enough, and convinced some investors to chip in, I got my own ship, so I could claim that freedom for myself. Or at least, I can choose my own fights. So cool. What about you, Jinx? I'm still that little girl who wants to see the world. I love learning. New songs, stories, history. I try to fill my journal with new things every night. Lovely. And you, Pelor? Your life with that mercenary group. It sounds rough. What made you join them? I love the way you say Pelor. I mean, well, when my father didn't come back, I had to start earning money at a pretty young age. I felt that I love pushing myself, my body, to see what I can do, to get stronger, better, and I just kind of fell in with the yellow cloaks. Old man Gungir paid well, and the jobs were exciting and varied. We were all in it together, and we accomplished crazy things as a team. But then you left. Well, eventually Gungir got old. Not so old for a dwarf, maybe. No way he was over 300. But old for a mercenary who leads from the front. After he fell, the yellow cloaks continued, but it wasn't the same. Then a job went wrong. I managed to slip away, but all my buddies went to prison. I could have laid low, but I just became a dancer instead. Because who'd suspect a dancer of having something to hide? So you just danced away. Yeah. Though... When we took a job, there always seemed to be a good case for who we were helping, or who we were hurting. <sighs> Looking back years later, though, I wonder if it was really just that the old dwarf was too good at making the case for whoever paid us, you know? Hmm. I think I like that when I fight against the sea, no matter how many times I win, the sea never loses. The winds, the waves, they do not care. The struggle is just for me, my ship and my crew. Hmm. In the wake of the storm, Adria spots an odd shape from the crow's nest. You see that? Good eye. Looks like a ship has run aground. Still has sails hanging off. Think it's recent? One sail still rigged. She may well have run aground in that storm we just passed. The party embark in a rowboat to investigate the shipwreck, named the Wispy Lass. The Lass was a dwarven ship, somewhat larger than the Sea Wing, perched at an angle, leaning toward the shore, with two of her three masts broken. Just as you are rowing your boat around the prow, Adria spots something colorful on the seaward side. A large swell hitting the side of the ship leaves behind a pair of gangly yellow-orange figures with fins who scramble up and into the hole just as you move out of sight of them. Yellow-orange? So not Elud then. Sounds like Samakun. Do you think these ones are Elud slaves or escapees? I'd rather not be fighting slaves. I wonder, though, could they have had something to do with crashing the ship? And now they're coming to loot it? How do you feel about killing pirates? Aye, I can do that. It's time for adventuring. Next time on Tales from My RPG Campaign. Gerta, Paramjeet. I hope you've been on your best behavior. Because there may be a little leeway in your sentences. A, a bit of a parole opportunity. If you would consider this fellow's job offer. What kind of job? Mm-hmm. He's hoping you could test out some new equipment. <laughs>